Thank you for joining us and welcome to another edition of Answers Network. I'm your host, Alan Cardoza. For those of you that have been listening, sending in questions and comments, thank you so much. Please continue to help spread the word that every Monday from 11 a.m. to noon Pacific time, this show will bring on special guests that can inspire, educate, and in some cases entertain while bringing answers and options to making our lives happier, healthier, and more successful. And I'd really appreciate if you could all do me a big favor. Please forward one of our shows to your social media group and to someone you know who can benefit from a particular subject. This is one powerful way that we together can make a positive influence in the world. Now, I can tell you that uh, today uh, we have someone who is going to be able to make a positive influence on all of us Uh, because it's an area that is very near and dear to me right now. But before we get to that, um, I want to talk a little bit about the fact that we're doing this show uh, uh, on Martin Luther King's birthday. And in the past, I've had some very interesting and thought-provoking guests uh, to honor Dr. King. Today, I'm going to start the show with a powerful lesson. And it isn't a quote from Martin Luther King, although I will bring up some after this. Uh, This was a lesson where a high school class is learning about the Salem witch trials. Their teacher told them that they were going to play a game. She said, I'm going to come around and whisper to each of you whether you're a witch or you're a regular person. Your goal is to build the largest group possible that does not have a witch in it. In the end, any group found to include a witch gets a failing grade. Well, the teens dove into grilling each other. One fairly large group formed, but most of the students broke into small exclusive groups where they were pretty sure that they didn't have a witch. They turned away anyone they thought gave off even a hint of guilt. Okay, the teacher said, you've got your groups. Time to find out which ones fail. All witches, please raise your hand. No one raised their hand. The kids were confused. They told the teacher that he'd messed up the game. Did I, said the teacher. Was anyone in Salem actually a witch? Or... Did everyone just believe what they were told? And that is how you show kids how easy it is to divide a community. Now, unfortunately, we live in a time we have to show adults as well. Shunning, scapegoating, placing blame, and dividing others, it will destroy far more than they will protect. And again, I bring this up because I believe this is something that Dr. King, a message he was trying to get out as well. Now, for everybody out there, don't allow fear to cloud your decisions. Use your own discernment. Trust your heart and your gut. Think about what you've been told and who benefits from you believing it. If you And um, for the students out there, if you know a teacher's political affiliation, they've already failed at their job. The best teachers will show you where to look, but they won't tell you what you see or what you must think. So with that, um, I now want to share a couple of quotes, again, from Martin Luther King in honor of this day. One of his quotes is, we may have all come on different ships, but we're in the same boat now. Another is, the function of education is to teach one to think intensively and to think critically. Intelligence plus character, that is the goal of true education. And the quality, not the longevity of of one's life, is what's important. 
And with that, I say that joining us to discuss many ways to improve the quality of our life is Brigitte Mars. Uh, Brigitte is an herbalist, a nutritional consultant of natural health with over 50 years of experience. She is a founding and professional member of the American Herbalist Guide. Um, and Brigitte is the author of many books, including Natural Remedies for, a, uh, for Mental and Emotional Health, The Sexual Herbal, Addiction-Free Naturally, the, nat uh, the Natural First Aid Handbook, and The Desktop Guide to Herbal Medicine, to name just a few. Her latest project is a phone app called iPlant. She also has an online herbal healing course, and you can learn about both as well as a wealth of knowledge by checking out uh, Brigitte's website at www.brigittemars.com, and that's B-R-I-G-I-T-T-E-M-A-R-S.com. But if you're driving, don't try to take that down. Know that we will have all of this information in our show notes uh, by going to answers.network. With that, Brigitte, thank you for joining us on Answers Network. My pleasure and honor, Alan. Thank you. Well, what I'd like to, to start with is if you can give us a little bit of background because um, you know, I've... Um, Fortunately, I've been on this earth for quite some time, and I was looked at as somebody who was uh, somewhat of a, um, you know, a plant guy or, uh, you know, they'd say a, um, a health nut. Uh, and as I was telling you before the show that, you know, even as a room dad, you know, I'd bring my drinks to class and the young kids would go, that looks like pond scum. Um, give us a little bit of a history of... Uh, of this, uh, this movement of how, how we got away from eating healthy um, and how we can now get back into uh, a culture of, of eating well and putting things in our body that's good for us. Well, you know, it is kind of interesting, Ellen. If you watch an hour of TV, what you see is a lot of ads for junk food and mm -hmm. pharmaceuticals. Eat this food take these drugs, eat this food, take these drugs. And, uh, you know, I think for a long time, you know, even with the American Cancer Society, maybe 30, 40 years ago, there was a feeling like what you eat has no effect on whether or not you get cancer. And I'm really glad to say that we're starting to look at that a lot of the things that the health nuts were talking about um, 50, 60 years ago were really right on. And not only does it affect our physical health, but it also affects our mental and emotional states of being. And in this country, it seems that when people have a physical condition, they go to one type of physician, but when they have something going on, such as anxiety, depression, mm -hmm. memory loss, there's a different kind of doctors. And yet in Asian medicine, food, herbs, acupuncture, um, they're used for mental and emotional health. And we do know that the mental body can affect the physical body and the physical body can affect the mental body. So here we are, it's time to talk about it and you know, take some responsibility because all of these conditions, there are simple things that we can do, not to say you, know, you don't wanna talk to your healthcare professional, but I'm trying to encourage people to be their their first choice for healthcare, and then everything else is extra. Well, first of all, I couldn't agree more. And you brought up uh, the Asian community, and having done some recent research, um, the country of Singapore uh, is now been named as a blue zone, and one of the and their life expectancy as well as their uh, their health span has been on an upward trajectory uh, in in an incredible fashion, you know, having gone up like 25% just in the last 40 or 50 years. On the other hand, the U.S. Uh, life expectancy and health expectancy 
is on a downward trajectory after you know many many years of of leading the world in that area. Um, do you also attribute that to the um, you know the the advertising, the drunk, the the junk food, and and our diet as Americans. Um, yeah, absolutely. But we, you know, we could look at it from so many ways. You know, chemicals in the water, chemicals in the air, um, pesticides in our food, um, and unfortunately, you know, one pharmaceutical drug often can lead to having to use another drug because there's very often right. side effects. And so, you know, some of my good friends are doctors and one of my doctor friends said, you know, I really don't like offering so many prescriptions, but if people came to see me and I just said, go home, drink plenty of fluids, uh, have some, you know, chicken soup with lots of garlic in it and take some vitamin C, they would think that I wasn't doing my job. And very often, even though physicians are there to make recommendations, very often it's the patient compliance that's the most difficult because people say, I'll take a pill, but I don't want to lose that 10 pounds. I don't want to quit smoking. I don't want to drink less coffee or less alcohol. And so natural medicine really, Alan, is for people that are motivated. But I think there's a lot of people who are are really realizing, look, I don't want to be on these drugs my whole life. Maybe they want to have a baby. Maybe they, um, you know, find that as they get older, you know, other things start to creep into their life. So I love that taking some time and energy to do self-care for yourself can lead to so many benefits, not only physically, but mentally too. Well, <clears throat> that's interesting what you brought up in regards to what your doctor said. Um, I would like to think that more doctors that uh, that think that way would be strong enough to say, um, not going to do it. I'm not going to try to put you on this drug that you're going to have to take for the rest of your life or something that's going to slow down your metabolism and you're then going to put on weight. So you're then going to come back in here because of the fact that you're going to now want something for the weight gain. Um, you know, I, I would like to think that we're going to turn this corner. Um, and I'll tell you a story that of, of uh, me finding a new doctor because of that. Um, and I, I think I've talked about it on the air. Um, six months ago, um, I had a massive heart attack. Mm. And I had so many people that said, you're the last person that we would have even thought that. Well, it turns out there was there, there's a hereditary component to it um, because of my health and conditioning. Uh, most doctors that were involved said it saved my life, uh, that that's why I got through it. Uh, but I had a, a cardiologist that when I started talking about the things that I wanted to do, natural things that I wanted to do, uh, because he immediately put me on after, after this, put me on four medications. And, and right after they put the stint in, I felt great. I wanted to go home the same day. I said, okay, I'm ready. Can I go? I go, no, no, no. We still have to do these things. Well, after those drugs kicked in, I felt terrible. And they said, this is what we want you to take now for the rest of your life. So this never happens again. So I started doing my research. And as an international detective, that's what I do. And, and I found so many incredible natural ways to deal with the same subject. So I went back to the cardiologist and explained what I wanted to do and talked about uh, um, uh, what uh, red rice yeast and, uh, and bergamot and baby aspirin and um, I forget the other one now. But anyway, and, and all of these things. And I said, you know, my investigation shows that these things are going to do the same thing as these pharmaceuticals. And I didn't have a blood pressure problem before this. Why would I be on blood pressure medicine now? And he told me to quit going to the internet and quit asking questions. Mm -hmm. um, I, I said, thank you. I walked out of his office. I went to another cardiologist, uh, sat down with him and said, I have questions and I have things that I want to discuss. Here are some of the things. Are you okay with me asking these questions and us discussing it? He said, absolutely. I said, you're now my new cardiologist. 
Bingo. Good move. And unfortunately, um, a lot of people just want to take the pill, but you're so right. I mean, there's dietary things we can do, red yeast rice, garlic, hawthorn, eating tart apples. Uh, rather than only thinking about the heart, we can think about the liver and the kidneys that help to regulate fluids in the body and help to break down fats. So there, unfortunately, nutrition is not a big part of what people learn in medical school, but hopefully it will be in the future. And I'm not trying to divide the country or the people or say it's us against them. It's like, I think the best health is going to come when we put our heads and hearts together and look at what we can do as individuals to help get ourselves out of a pickle rather than more and more and more drugs. The older you get, you're going to be on like 10 pills rather than four. And, and, and I completely agree. And, and I say that not trying to divide either. In fact, um, my, my general doctor, um, that's a, a concierge doctor, uh, he is an MD and an ND. And, and right. that's what was important to me. So, so he, doesn't, he doesn't go to one or the other. He looks at both things. And at times, I'm very thankful you know, that he comes up with something that he learned while in medical school. But at the same time, we go to a lot of things that he learned while becoming an ND. Uh, for those that don't know, that's a naturopathic doctor. Um, so I agree with you. It, it isn't a matter of, of, of division. It's a matter of inclusion. Uh, it just concerns me when, when you have a doctor that doesn't want to include because I want to say, well, what are you afraid of? You know? <laughs> so, and and when it comes to mental health, you know, I've been saying for years, like wherever two or more are gathered, probably one is on antidepressants, and I do think that there's a lot of people being medicated for things like depression and anxiety and uh, OCD and memory loss, and we might need to look at some more simple things, like could they be eating a food that they're allergic to. And I know that sounds weird, like could allergies affect our consciousness? Well, we do know that allergens can cause inflammation in the body, joint mm -hmm. inflammation, sinus inflammation, uh, skin inflammation, but also brain inflammation. We're also finding out that a lot of our neurotransmitters are made in our guts. And so the copious use of antibiotics or even eating animals that are treated with antibiotics, that could be disturbing our gut mm -hmm. microbiome, as well as eating things we're allergic to. We even know that things like heavy metals, um, such as cooking our food in aluminum cookware. I've been saying this for 60 years. It's only now coming out in the mainstream media. You know, um, we've all heard the term mad as a hatter from the Alice in yes. Wonderland story. Yeah. But in the 1800s, hat makers would dip felt in a mercury solution so they could shape these like grandiose chapeaus. And after a while, the hat makers would develop neurological tics. Ugh. And uh, that led to calling people mad as a hatter. But for how many decades were they putting mercury fillings in our yeah. mouth saying it's totally safe, but yet you can't even buy a mercury thermometer at the drugstore anymore because it's considered so toxic that if one breaks, the vapors would cause toxins in the whole household. Um, so food allergies, heavy metal toxicity, we certainly know the trauma affects us. And unfortunately, yeah. so many of us have experienced some kind of trauma. It may be that some people have a higher need for a certain vitamin. Maybe they need more B vitamins or more magnesium to sleep better, to have less pain. So uh, my book, Natural Remedies for Mental mm -hmm. and Emotional Health, it's all about all kinds of ideas, food, herbs, supplements, which you can buy at the natural food store, um, you know, color therapy. People don't realize that color can affect our consciousness. We think, oh, color, it doesn't matter. And yet Madison Avenue is thinking all the time about what color should we make this package so yeah. that people buy our product. And so, you know, I like to tell people when you need to feel calmer, wear blue. 
When you need to get more energized, think about wearing red. When you need to be very mentally focused, yellow. And yet I see people who are just like wearing gray day after day, and yet the world might be a little gray with all the storms and the cold. But like this might be a day where you need to like brighten your world and color is energy. So maybe that's a day you brighten things up. Even light therapy. How many people are going to work in the dark? They're coming home in the dark. They're mm -hmm. under fluorescent lighting all day long. And yet we do know that lack of light, seasonal affectative disorder can affect our moods. And very often in areas where it's dark a lot, you know, it's dark, um, you know, all winter long, there's higher incidences of alcoholism, addiction, suicidal, um, be, you know, suicidal things happening. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so getting outdoors in full spectrum light, because light enters our eyes and nourishes our brain and affects our hormones as well as our moods. And a lot of these ideas in natural remedies for mental and emotional health are simple, inexpensive things you can do. And another thing I want to say is a lot of the things when it comes to food and herbs, they're folk remedies that have been used by millions of people for thousands of years. And I always go back to that because I've, I worked in a holistic pharmacy for 20 years and I saw a lot of drugs that were approved oh, and then they're taken off the shelf. And so I really like partnering with things that maybe our ancestors used or uh, I feel like hmm, they, they have been studied by humans using them, not like a, you know, rat study or a two-year study on healthy college students when it might be the elderly or the pregnant people who are going to be taking these substances. Exactly. And and I will get people that will ask me because I will bring up things like that. Well, for instance, you brought up as far as light. Um, I know that I try to get out, out onto the balcony where I can see the sunset because I want to get that last bit of light into my eyes before I go to sleep or before I go back in and do eat or whatever we're going to do. Uh, so there's so many things like that. But um, the answer that that I have given, because I'll get people to say, well, if if all of these, you know, ancient remedies and stuff like that worked, why aren't they doing it now? And I tell them, I said, because big pharma can't monetize it. You, you can't patent a plant. And, you know, yeah. one great example, the dandelion. I also have a new book out called Dandelion Medicine. You know, dandelion leaves uh, have been found to be very diuretic and as diuretic is one of the leading diuretic drugs. Now, if you take a chemical diuretic, it depletes your body of potassium, but uh -huh. dandelions are diuretic and give you potassium and it's free and it would be growing everywhere. But the same kind of companies have us thinking, oh, you got dandelions in your yard, you need to not only spray them, but then you need to like drive to the store and buy gasoline and cut them down. And yet the dandelions are aerating the soil. And I really feel, Alan, that a lot of the so-called weeds are really some of the Jedi plants that adapt to adversity that can mm -hmm. really strengthen our immunity. So, you know, it's, it's said that the, um, you know, in America, we're using a third of our nation's water to water grass so we can mow it down. Like we're giving all this water to a crop that nobody's eating on, unless you're a goat or maybe a cow or something. Um, and so that's got to change. We, we really need to start respecting water more and realize that maybe those weeds that adapt to adversity like frost and drought and uh, you know intense heat, that they are survivor plants and they just might have something for us. But you are so right. You can't patent a plant. And the pharmaceutical companies, even though in the year 1900, about 80% of all the pharmaceuticals came from the plants, there was this movement to either synthesize it or extract just one chemical component, one alkaloid, like ephedrine from ephedra to mm -hmm. make Sudafed or um, birth control pills came from wild yam, aspirin from willow bark or meadowsweet or aspen trees. So they just looked at one active component, but herbalists are saying 
herbal medicine is not just one chemical component. It's alkaloids, vitamins, minerals, fiber, chlorophyll. It's a symphony of all these healing things that transform the nutrients in the earth into a form that our bodies recognize, have evolved with, adapted to, and very many of them are really quite delicious and nutritious. <laughs> you know, I, and I, I love the fact when, when you shifted us over to, to focusing on mental health, which is what I had intended to do. In fact, I think, uh, I think you can add mental telepathy to some of the skills that you have, because that's exactly where I was going when you went there. So you can now quote that as well. Um, yeah. But, but because of, of it, uh, mental health, I think so many people only focus on the physical thing. So they think, okay, if I have this, okay, well, this uh, is a nourishment and it helps in this way, or it doesn't help in that way. But uh, I want to talk a little bit more about mental health and in, in a particular area, um, which is um, what, what some people call attention deficit disorder, which by the way, I refer to it as attention surplus. So um, let's talk about how, um, how foods are affecting those that people are diagnosing with ADD and, and how just shifting their diet can do a lot more than, than some of the pharmaceutical medications that they're actually giving many of our children. It's true. And I've, I've even heard that there are some schools that get more money and funding the more kids that are being medicated. And, you know, uh. it's also interesting. There have been studies that show that kids that have ADHD often are the same kids that maybe had to take a lot of antibiotics for other conditions like ear infections mm. or strep throat. And so again, we know antibiotics can save lives, but there's a lot of kids who are on antibiotics, you know, every month or so for some type of new infection. And that right there could have been a sign, maybe the child has a dairy allergy or a gluten allergy or corn or soy or peanut butter. Those are all some of the really common allergenic foods. So now you have a child who has behavior problems. And I also want to say, I also think that ADHD could be a superpower. We're so, exactly. we're so, we're so quick to label everything, uh -huh. you know, so we need to treat this. And it, I think it's really hard for kids to sit in a chair for many, many hours. And we've seen a lot of school programs be diminished because not every kid is a jock and not every kid is a scholar. Some are artists, some are thespians, some are, you know, poets. Um, there's a lot of ways that we can find our true calling. But I do want to say the first thing I would recommend for ADHD is a dietary change. And I've seen, I just want to share an example. Someone came to see me and uh, said, our child, they're, they're suggesting the child go on medication. And I said, what does your child crave? And the mother said, boy, ever since she was 18 months old, she would go and like bang her head on the refrigerator and say, cheese, 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 cheese. And I said, hmm, I wonder if she has a dairy allergy because we often crave the things we're allergic to. Because when we eat something that we're sensitive or allergic to, it will increase white blood cell production, which is an immune response because we feel comforted like, oh, wow, now my white blood cells are really working overtime. But that could be the problem. And again, we live in a time where whatever the allergen is, you can go to the natural food store and they've got, you know, gluten free noodles and cookies and they've got dairy free this. And I'm not saying we all need to live off of uh, gluten free, you know, chocolate cupcakes or anything. There's a lot of junk out there, too. But there, mm -hmm. there are alternatives. And I do find it's a lot easier if the whole family goes on the program rather than like, oh, you get the the beige cupcake and everybody else gets the nice little I pink agree. cupcake. And I do want to share that my uh, grandson, who's now 20, he uh, was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome when he was maybe three or four. And his mom, my daughter, said, I'm going to try taking him off of gluten. And she did. And ever since then, he was in the gifted program and is on a roll every time. But instead of just like, oh, my God, he's a special needs child, which he was, uh, lifting the brain fog enabled him to really excel. And I, I think that 
we will try, we will put children on a drug rather than making a family cooperative effort to see if there's something we can do. And, you know, even things like media, if the TV's always on, if there's fast music always on, yeah. even the idea of like driving your kids to preschool or something, you know, in the morning and the music is really fast or it's all this troubling uh, news broadcast or whatever, like that's all going into you. So not, we also have toxic media affecting our brains. Exactly. Well, we, that's, in fact, I'd love for us to do a whole show on toxic media sometime because it's, it's, it's incredible. Now what we're going to do, I need to take a break, but uh, when we come back, uh, can you give us some of the, the specific foods that tend to help a particular area? So if you have somebody out there saying, I'm dealing with this, um, well, here's a, uh, you know, here's a food that has had success in that. I'm not a asking you to diagnose or anything else. But I think a lot of people would love to hear that. And for everybody out there, know that, you know, a lot more of this information is going to be in the book. But for right now, we're going to take a break. We'll be right back. You're listening to or watching Answers Network. Conflict International are experts at uncovering the truth. Our specialist team has decades of experience in providing a range of bespoke investigation and intelligence services to companies and individuals. Whether you need professional screening or background checks of employees, due diligence of potential clients or business partners, asset tracing services, or surveillance, Conflict International has a rapid response team on hand to get you to the heart of the matter. Our key strength is in our global capabilities. We can tap into an extensive network of trusted professional investigators based in most jurisdictions worldwide, enabling us to go almost anywhere a case takes us. Conflict International has decades of experience with a diverse range of skills among our team developed from backgrounds in military and security intelligence services as well as practiced lawyers. Visit our website today at conflictinternational.com to find out more about our services. That's conflictinternational.com. Global reach, local knowledge. And we're back. You're listening to or watching Answers Network. We are speaking with Brigitte Mars. And her latest book is Natural Remedies for Mental and Emotional Health. And again, that was one of the things that drew me in because I've looked so much at, at food, more so from the standpoint of the physical health. I love the fact that amongst many of her books that she has one that really focuses on mental and emotional. And with that said, uh, when we went to break, what are some of the foods that... Um, that are affecting us, or I'm sorry, what are some of the, the foods that if we are being affected in a certain way that may help us um, get through whatever we might be dealing with? Well, you know, because depression is such a common mm -hmm. ailment right now, um, and I don't think Western medicine has really looked at some of the principles of Asian medicine, that when we have depression, we might want to look at What's going on with the liver? The liver uh -huh. and gallbladder, according to the principles of Asian medicine, correspond to the emotions of anger, depression, and creativity. Okay, so let's say we're looking at that. We could also look at thyroid health and all of that. Uh -huh. But what would be making our liver, which helps to clean the blood, kind of have this like, ah, oh, I feel so depressed and lethargic and all that. So I do think that um, the lack of sour foods, a little bit of sour. This morning, I started my day with a little lemon and water, get alkaline. You know, that's a simple thing. The liver loves it when we eat greens. And I'm not talking about iceberg lettuce shipped in from another continent. I'm talking about things like kale and arugula and, you know, uh, a cabbage. And dandelion. Dan dandelion greens, absolutely. And I'm a, a big believer in eating all the colors of the rainbow. The American diet has gotten rather beige, so watch out for that. Um, berries are really good. They also emulate the sour flavor, uh, raspberries, blackberries, mm -hmm. tart apples. Um, and, you know, this, this is really just my theory here, Alan. But if we think back, you know, to hundred years ago when hunters were, and, and still in many parts of the world are still doing that, they mm -hmm. kill an animal, 
with appreciation, eat the parts of the animal maybe that they think is going to really help them, like the heart or the testicles or the liver. And what about eating animals that live in agricultural situations where it's overcrowded, it's smelly, the lights are left on, they're being fed drugs all the time, they become cannibalistic. Could we be picking up on the anxiety and depression by eating animals that live in a hellacious kind of situation? Because health food stores do sell things like thyroid and adrenal to help our thyroid and adrenal glands. So, I mean, I think it's pretty much a given that if we are going to eat animal products, we should really support the farmers that are doing a better job, whether it's grass fed or pasture raised. Um, but I also think that we harm our liver's ability to be able to clean the blood by eating a lot of fried foods, chips, uh, poor quality oils like canola oil, soy oil, safflower oil, because when the machinery presses the oil out of the beans or canola seed or whatever, the machinery heats up to over 300 degrees. So the oils are heated. And even uh -huh. though it might not list this as an ingredient, we're ingesting free radicals all the time, which are kind of congesting to the body. And and even things like microwaving our food. It's funny when people feel bad, they say things like I'm zapped <laughs> or I'm fried. <laughs> I'm zapped. I'm fried. I'm, I'm baked. I'm toasted, you know, which might mean something else different in certain yeah. parts of the country. <laughs> but in any case, when we're always zapping and frying our food, it could be making us feel zapped and fried. So um, again, I'm not saying we have to eat everything raw, but eating more fresh fruits and vegetables, more colors. Could we be going for a salad once a day? And could we take the extra step of making our own dressing with some extra virgin olive oil? I think that right there would be of great benefit. And, and that's a great point when you bring up the, the oils. You mentioned some of the bad oils, but I love that you're also now mentioning one of the good oils, um, which is, like you said, the extra virgin olive oil. Um, what are some of the, the other essential oils or um, tinctures, whatever, that, that can help with mental health? Um, and what are some of the best ways to take them? Um, and let's talk a little bit about, you know, some of these, because they can go through um, the blood-brain barrier, how it actually can get into our brain and help us. Whereas in some cases, some of these same oils, uh, if they are, as you said, pressed or, or detrimental, they can also get through the blood brain barrier and, and do harm as well. Well, you know, you mentioned the term essential oil. And I yeah. just wanted to say that a really simple thing that can shift our consciousness almost immediately is to smell some kind of essential oil. And so I have here a bottle of uh, lavender oil. So let's say, oh, I'm really mm -hmm. freaking out. I'm going to be late to my job. And I'm really, oh, I'm freaking out. I'm going down freak out freeway. And then I open up a bottle of lavender oil and I take five deep inhalations on each nostril now I'm going down lavender lane because our nasal cavities are in very close proximity to our brain. So something as simple as smelling something can help us through a difficult situation. And I want to mention how many people are working in an environment where there's chemical air fresheners that might mm. really be neurotoxic. There's this bank that I have to go to to pay my credit card. And I, I mean, I only have to go in there like once a month. But what about the people that work in that environment? They don't even notice it anymore. Sure. They are smelling petrochemical. It's not like it's really a pine needles or rosemary or fresh lemon. It's petrochemicals that are, if, it, if you're smelling it, it's going into your bloodstream. Yeah. And it's going into your lungs and your bloodstream. So we need to think about that. And what about people who are like slathering themselves with petrochemical, mineral oil, synthetic fragrances? And sometimes you can smell these people like a, a block away, you know, you, like you, you, you mean like a cologne or a perfume, right? Cologne, an aftershave, a sunscreen, a hairspray, um, you know, all these things. People are in a cloud of these things. So I think you know, our health, our mental health is also closely related to the health of our planet. 
And we know that our, our planet is suffering. So that's another place. So when we partner with natural remedies and say, yeah, I think I'm going to try the lavender oil or I'm going to try the St. John's wort herb, another great herb for depression or lemon balm herb. That means that somewhere on the face of the earth, there's going to be fields of plants with happy pollinators, bees and butterflies and safe environments, not polluting the water. And I really think that that's the direction we should be looking at because uh, as we help our planet to heal, it can help ourselves to heal. Well, I, I, I have a question that's coming in. And again, I want to thank those people that send in questions. Uh, we get these sometimes through instant message or people email us ahead of time. Uh, we send out a newsletter, um, you know, sometimes, you know, a week ahead or a couple of days ahead of time. And so if anybody has a question, feel free to send it to us. If you get it to us ahead of time, that's great. If you get it to us during the show, we'll try to get to it. But again, I thank those that do. This one reads, I'm a 55-year-old, soon-to-be grandma who has struggled with gut issues since childhood. A few years ago, I realized I was gluten intolerant. Cutting out gluten has helped, but I still get bouts with stomach issues and fatigue at times. Uh, I'm eating very clean and I exercise regularly. What else can I do uh, to feel like a normal person and not worry about everything I eat? And this is from Meredith in Santa Cruz. Well, that's a very personal question, but, you know, it could be gluten. It could also be dairy. It could be soy. It could be corn. There could be other things. And I don't know enough about this um, lady. And right. I thank you for her question. But I would wonder about, you know, what else she's doing? What was going on in your life when it started? What medications are you on? I mean, I do think things, a simple thing that many of us could do to help improve our digestion is not to drink with meals. And I know that is so the American way. You go to a restaurant and they keep filling your glass up with ice water. But when we drink a lot of water with meals, we dilute our natural digestive enzymes. And icy cold is even worse because it causes things to constrict. So, you know, that's one thing. There's many herbs that can help digestion, like peppermint tea, ginger tea. But I, I also have a private practice where I help people figure out what's going on and it's specific to them. And I want to know everything that they're doing. It's, you know, that's sort of a blanket, um, you know, big, big question there. No, and, and, and I realize that, but again, we try to, to, um, you know, to address as many things as possible. As I look at this one, um, it sounds like they're, I mean, it says that they're eating clean and they're exercising regularly. Um, so, uh, and that they've already cut out gluten, but it sounds like some of the things you've brought up, something as simple, and I didn't even know is, you know, maybe drinking the liquids is um, keeping, you're saying it's keeping the stomach from actually helping them digest things properly. Right. And there's so many things you can find at the health yeah. food store, whether it be enzymes, uh, peppermint capsules, umeboshi plum paste. There's so many remedies, but I would want to know more about the person. And I think a lot of people think they're doing a great thing by eating more plant-based. And then they start doing a lot of soy products like, oh, I'm going to, I want the soy milk or the soybeans. Soy is actually really hard to digest for a lot of people. It's also a common allergen. So when I meet with people, I ask them to keep a food journal and try to be a detective to figure it out. But, but if we have time, Alan, I'd like to say a few words about anxiety, because I think Please. that anxiety Please. is such a big thing. And I've been around people that are having panic attacks. So we know that uh, when a person has an anxiety attack, it's often when their blood sugar is really low. So let's say you get up in the morning and you start your day, how American, with coffee. Maybe you've got a couple cups of coffee because you go to work and they got free coffee there. They don't have kombucha or carrot juice, but they got free coffee. <laughs> um, so when our, or maybe we skip breakfast, but we ate something sweet couple cookies or a pastry. So that makes your blood sugar go up and then it crashes. So, okay. So if you have anxiety, you want to look at one or what are some of the triggers? Could you have a healthy snack with you? Maybe some Brazil nuts or, you know, something from the health food store that's a high fiber, high protein type of bar that's sugar-free. 
Sugar and caffeine are the enemies of anxiety. Um, so let's say someone's anxious. What could they do? Well, the simple trick we just learned a minute ago, open up a bottle of lavender oil, take some deep inhalations of lavender oil. There's also a little gem you can find at natural mm -hmm. food stores called Rescue Remedy. It's a, a Bach flower remedy. Two drops of Rescue Remedy is really good for stress, panic. If you don't want to ingest it, you only need two drops. You can put it on your wrist. It's like a little miracle in a bottle. There's or even it, a red it soaks in it, it soaks in through your skin as well. Absolutely. You know, Alan, the, we are seeing so many drugs being delivered transdermally through the skin. Heart medicine, diabetes medicine, um, and I, you know, sometimes like to remind people the first, uh, you know. Albert Hoffman, when he was working on a remedy for migraine headaches, got some LSD on his fingertips. He didn't eat it, but just getting it on his fingertips made him, I have to leave work and drive his, ride his bike home. So we're not thinking that what we put on our bodies is affecting you. I had a client the other day, a beautiful woman with really, really bleach blonde hair. And, and um, I said, you know, I can appreciate, you know, wanting to have hair the color you want. But when you put these chemicals on your scalp month after month at, at the roots and leave them on for an hour, and these chemicals are designed to remove the pigment from your mm -hmm. hair, could it also be going into your bloodstream, crossing the blood-brain barrier, and also even contributing to lesions or even dementia or memory loss as we get older? And again... There are natural things you can buy that color your hair with, um, you know, chamomile and lemon and oak bark and things like that, too. See, there you go. There you go with telepathy again. That was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to ask, well, is there an alternative? But you had that as well. So the, the, the telepathy is still working. Um, we've only got about, um, we've got about two minutes. Um, I'd love to end with whatever you see as one of your favorite success stories. Oh my goodness. So, so many success stories. And I, I don't know if I can narrow it down, but I, I feel that this is a way of empowering people to make healthier choices. It's good for people. It's good for the planet. And, you know, I think you already mentioned my grandson, rather than like a lifelong diagnosis of Asperger's, you know, now mm -hmm. he's 20 and working in LA in the music industry, graduated with honors. Like it was a dietary change. And mm -hmm. that's really all it took. We didn't have to do a drug. And I really think that this is an opportunity to love yourself more. I think a lot of people feel that they don't have time to take care of themselves. And yet it might mean get up an hour earlier because you're going to take care of your kids, your spouse, your boss, your car, your dog. You need time mm -hmm. for you. And getting up an hour earlier means there is time for yoga. There is time to pack a healthy lunch. There is time to take your supplements that are going to help you get through the day. And you might even lay your clothes out the night before and think about what am I trying to emulate tomorrow where I, I want to feel calm. Right now we're in a huge snowstorm, so it's freezing here right now. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that this is an opportunity to love yourself more. It's good for the earth. It's good for yourself. It's good for your family. Give it a try. There's nothing to lose natural remedies for mental and emotional health because happier people make a better world. So we absolutely. need absolutely, absolutely. And again, so first of all, Brigitte, thank you so much. And for everybody out there, um, again, if you go to her website, there's a wealth of information there. Um, so that's, that's it's BrigitteMars.com. Uh, and again, if you're driving, we'll make sure that we have all of this in the show notes. So Brigitte, again, thank you so much. The time just flew by. I love having you on here. I love what you're doing. Uh, please keep us uh, um, alerted when the next book comes out or the next time uh, we can have you on to help more people. Thank you so much. Many blessings to you and your listeners, Alan. All right. Thank you. And for everybody out there, let's see here. Um, 
If you will be with us next week, we're going to be joined by Dr. Frida Birnbaum as she discusses coping with codependency. And please visit our archives of past interviews at Answers Network or just subscribe to the show. You can do that through YouTube, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, SoundCloud, Rumble, Spreaker, and many other popular podcasts, um, uh, various platforms. If you like what you hear, please leave a review. I want you to know that we really appreciate it. And this is the best way that we can get the word out to other people. And the next time you're on Instagram, Facebook, or X, please remember, stop by our page, check out some of our latest posts. And if you like them, please like us and spread the word for everybody out there. Be good human beings and be with us again next week on Answers Network.